Spiritual Ramblings by Joseph Albrick. Introduction. Spiritual Ramblings is a compilation of short articles by Joseph Albrick published in various forms with the general theme of spirituality. Each is complete in itself and have been arranged in random order rather than following any linking theme. Some of themes will be familiar to readers of my other books, some less so, but all seek to remind us all of our spiritual base. The article An Alternative Interpretation of the Sermon on the Mount formed the basis of three chapters in the book Alternative Jesus. Spirituality and Politics. Spirituality is simply what comes from within. What feels right for us, and that comes primarily from understanding who we are. There are things that feel right for us, things that don't, things we want and things don't want. Living spiritually does not mean sitting on a mountain top meditating, or divorcing ourselves from the physical world. If we could come to know ourselves perfectly and follow that understanding we would be following a spiritual life even if to others it would appear to be a purely physical life. The difference would be that we do not have to look for gurus, leaders or masters in any form in the physical world. We have our master and guru within. This does not mean ignoring everything that was said by others only that we hear in relation in what feels right to us. Politics is a reality we have to live with. We have to live with the physical consequences of politics. If we ignore politics and end up in a world we do not like we cannot complain. Many things can be changed if we have the will, and even if we fail we have succeeded if we have fulfilled our spiritual being as best we can. There is the illusion that in Australia we live in a democracy. We do not. Voting does not make a democracy unless politicians tell the truth. All that happens is that we vote for lies with no idea what the outcome will be. This is spirituality comes into politics. It is not a case of being a spiritual way to vote or not vote, but asking the question are being told the truth. In the physical world truth is a rare commodity. We have politicians telling us their version of truth that is distorted to fit the outcomes they want, which may or may not be for the common good. In my book Alternative Genesis I raise the issue of a very common way politicians tell lies. This is accomplished by telling lies in a way that cannot be shown to be a lie so that people will accept the lie as truth in the absence of proof to the contrary. This was the basic format used by the Spanish Inquisition. As you read this try to find a way of proving you are not a witch. You are probably not a witch, or at least not the type that flies around on a broomstick. But can you prove it? The basic format of the Spanish Inquisition was to start with a campaign of lies and misinformation, raise the level of lies and misinformation to fear and loathing, and then destroy. The crucial element is that there must never be a means by which the lies and misinformation can be proved to be untrue and that the lies must be repeated over and over to normalize them. The lies need to become common knowledge. That sums up Australian politics at this time. Lie after lie repeated over and over with no scrutiny as to if they can be supported in any way. The answers to this form of political distortion come from within. Ask yourself if the statements made by politicians can be supported. Don't be surprised if your answer does not conform to the herds of people believing that repetition equals truth. This is how it is with thinking spiritually. Often what you know is opposite to external wisdoms. A related problem is that the Spanish Inquisition leads to polarization. Everything becomes either or. The carbon tax will either save the planet or destroy the Australian economy. The probability is that neither is true. When faced with a similar problem, reducing carbon emissions from motor vehicles the solution was to write an Australian standard. Why not do the same for power generation? The reason for that example was to show that no real choice is either or. When we get rid of dogma from politics there are many possibilities. Professor Garnout is an economist and so it was inevitable that his report on climate change should be based on economics. If a scientist or an engineer had prepared the report the report would have been different. All have their place in finding ways of making this planet capable of sustaining the human race. If we do not the human race become extinct. 
politics in Australia in its present form is not helping. A spiritual approach to politics involves listening to everyone, dismissing what cannot be substantiated and listening to what comes from within. Spirituality is listening to what comes from within. None of us has all the answers and there is no system that is right for everyone. Answers in all things come from the collective consciousness and spirituality of us all. Politics in Australia in its present form is diametrically opposed to these principles. Politics have become self-serving for the good of politicians, not for the collective good of the electorate. This can change if we listen to what comes from within and apply that to the external world. Thinking without judgment, I meant blame. I have often been asked what thinking without judgment was like. I have to say that I have a feeling of inner peace on the few occasions that I have managed to achieve it I could not say what it was like. I couldn't give any examples as role models. Then I had an assignment comparing the difference in the ways that women's activist groups used social media in the Western world and in Asia. That may sound a dry sort of assignment but it was a fascinating subject to research. I decided to use as anchors two women I admire. The first was Gloria Sheenham for the Western activist and Aung San Suu Kyi for the Asian activist. They proved to be just the role models I needed. In her role as activist Gloria Steinem simply says what the problem is as she sees it and then opens the discourse in an attempt to find solutions. As a man I have no problem in listening to Gloria Steinem. Often the things she says I hadn't thought of as being problems and I find no blame attached to her words. That is important because if she led off with men out to blame for everything then I would be turned off immediately. The other style of feminism, the Germaine Greer style I reject because it is full of blame. I saw Germaine Greer interviewed by Andrew Denton and the conversation from Greer was that all men are misogynist bastards and if Andrew disagreed with her it was because he was a misogynist bastard. I often find Germaine Greer amusing with her ideas but I can never take her seriously. The reason? Heaping sexist judgments on people is not the way to get someone to listen to what you are saying. I see her now as more as a stand-up comic rather than a serious feminist. She may have caused shock and awe with her first assaults on society but it was the likes of Gloria Steinem that did the hard work. Can you imagine being shut inside your house for 20 years and not allowed to see your family? You captors tell you that you can leave any time but you must leave your country and never return. Aung San Suu Kyi just said no. It took many years but the generals in Burma finally had to listen. That is the power of the word no. After Suu Kyi had been released and allowed to participate in elections she started working with those who had been her captors to bring democracy to Burma. That is thinking without judgment. Democracy in Burma is a long time coming but I think it will be a lasting democracy. It will be a democracy achieved without blame. If it was with blame it would be a democracy achieved though armed conflict and that never leads to a real democracy. Armed uprisings usually end with a new dictator promising elections sometime in the future. I have always wondered how it takes five years to organize an election that never comes. There is hope that a democracy achieved without blame as in Burma cannot really be by the people for the people. Looking back at the instruction do not eat the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil I think I have been using the wrong word. Maybe thinking without blame might be better than thinking without judgment. Judgment is too broad in its meaning. Blame is a judgment, but it has a much narrower meaning. Gloria Steinem speaks and writes without blame. She lays out the problem as she sees it and makes the judgment that she would like things to change. In this sense she is not without judgment, but dialogue does not blame. This allows change to take place. Aung San Suu Kyi can suffer for years at the will of the generals and then work with them without any expression of blame. By just using the word no and working towards outcomes without blame Aung San Suu Kyi has changed the world. This is an example of how the world could change if we stopped blaming each other. What if Israel stopped blaming the Palestinians and the Palestinians stopped blaming Israel? 
One example of how a human-wide problem could be solved by negotiating without blame. I have always written using the judgment because judgment is the form in which blame becomes manifest in the physical. But I was missing that the sort of judgment I was writing about was the result of the thinking process, not the thinking process that caused the judgment. The thinking process is seeking to assign blame. Thinking without blame means we can make the judgments that we do not want someone in our lives or we want or do not want something. But if that is done without blame there is no need for anger or getting even. No blame no anger, which is possibly why it feels peaceful when it is achieved. And if there is no blame a solution to any problem can be found. My judgment is that the world needs more glorious Tynums and Ansan Sakais of both sexes. I thank them both for their example that has allowed me to see what I was really writing about. There are any number of videos on YouTube featuring Gloria Steinem and Aunt San Sakai I and they are worth watching to see how they say things rather than what they are saying. Part to right and wrong. Blame can be defined as making judgments about right and wrong. The whole question of right and wrong, and blame is the problem of imprecise language. The two concepts are virtually the same except that right and wrong is a duality and so we have a choice that requires a judgment. If you read any of my past material that uses the word judgment or right and wrong most of the time blame can be substituted. We judge right and wrong and the result is the appropriation of blame. It can be defined the other way around. Blame is the appropriation of right and wrong. Which of the two seems more appropriate is sometimes a difficult decision so in my writings feel free to substitute whatever seem the most appropriate. The concept of right and wrong is a concept that really fouls up the human race. It operates at three levels. The religious level. The legal level. The personal level. We can do anything we like, to anyone at any time and remain free of sin because whatever we are doing is God's will. Terrorism is often an extreme example of this concept. Declared jihad and kill the infidel. In the mind of the perpetrators they are free of sin. The Spanish Inquisition operated on the same principle. The persecution of witches and many other atrocities have occurred by invoking the same format. It goes back to the beginning of time. Whether or not the perpetrators of these acts are doing God's will is problematic. There is a section from Matthew that goes along the lines of you call my name but I do not know you. You say, but Lord, everything I have done I have done in your name. But still I do not know you, for as you do to the least of my creatures, you do unto me. Just because we do something in the name of God does not make it God's will. At the next level down, the legal, goes along the line of we can do anything we want to anyone at any time and provided it is legal, we remain free of sin. Our courts do not operate on justice, or any altruistic concepts. They operate on legality. Stealing from shareholders is okay as long as it is legal. Stitching someone up with an ambiguously worded contract is okay as long as it is done legally. We will see a lot of the legality concept in the next year. When the dust settles on the subprime debacle, and the world recession. The focus will turn to accountability. There will be a lot of it wasn't my fault, it was legal. It will be interesting to see how successful the architects of the subprime market at claiming the legal high ground. The bottom level is right and wrong. We can do anything we like to anyone at any time and provided we are right and they are wrong we remain free of sin. This works before and after the event. Right and wrong before the event is a cynical exercise in creating the other as the wrongdoer before acting. If we want to invade a sovereign country we might invent evidence of that country having weapons of mass destruction. If we do this well we might even convince ourselves that these weapons of mass destruction actually exist. It is interesting that before the invasion of Iraq Bush, Blair and Howard spent three weeks proving it was legal. Thus they remain doubly free of sin. Right and wrong, after the event, is finding a reason why we did something that was in hindsight, a mistake. Do we say I made a mistake? No. We find a reason we were right. There is a traffic accident. 
The driver of the car that hit the other says it was not my fault. I swerved to avoid the hammer that cut across in front of me. This may be true. But very often it is the excuse for driving poorly and no hammer existed, or if it did it did not cut across. But given a short space of time the hammer will exist, and will have cut across, if only in the head of the driver who caused the accident. That driver will, of course, remain free of sin. You lie to your lover. It takes no time at all to find a reason why you were right and it was their fault. Maybe you can find a reason why they deserved it. This is the concept of right and wrong. It is a means by which we can avoid personal responsibility by finding a reason why it is always the fault of someone else. Give a little practice it is possible to do anything you want to any, at any time and place, and remain free of sin under all circumstances. This using right and wrong, or blame, goes back at least as far as the writers of Genesis. God said who did this? It wasn't me it was her said Adam. It wasn't me it was Snake said Eve. And poor Snake at the bottom of the chain cops the lot. But God made it clear that none of them could escape responsibilities for their actions. That's the bad news. No matter how many reasons we may find to pass off our sin onto others by using blame we all remain responsible for our actions. Is it a spiritual problem? Is it our problem? A problem with living in this world is that we are constantly being bombarded with some very mean and nasty circumstances that are not of our doing. It is fashionable to say that we have chosen our problems to learn the lessons we need to learn and to some extent this is true. We end up in situations that come about because of our mistakes. We need to learn not to make those mistakes again. But in this world we are surrounded by little gods making wild decisions about right and wrong who cause problems that are not of our doing. If we want to say we have created everything situation we find ourselves in we are making it a lot more difficult than it need be. As Jesus said, the sun rises and the rain falls on the just and unjust alike. We are not responsible for everything that happens in our lives. We are responsible for our actions, but not the actions of others. It is not our place to take responsibility for everything. Decisions of others often have side effects that impinge on many innocent bystanders. We cannot always protect ourselves from strangers or the actions of those we thought we knew. Often we have to accept that we need to trust a person and that can be over a number of years with no reason not to trust them. If find that those people cannot be trusted it is not a spiritual failing that a trusted person proves to be otherwise. Nor is it a spiritual problem that we have suffered substantial financial, emotional or physical harm. What does become a spiritual problem is what we do about it. To live in this world we need a balance between the physical environment and our inner being. It is hard to realize sometimes that we are spiritual beings trying to make our way in a physical world. Whether we like it or not it is impossible to completely withdraw from the physical world, and our spiritual core does need physical support to survive in this environment. We may come from another place and return there at physical death but between birth and death we need physical support. And we cannot always choose what other people will do. If we try we become as gods and the problem is compounded. Where is the line between physically protecting ourselves and playing God? Is it possible to push back sufficiently to protect ourselves without cause harm? This is where the spiritual problem comes in. If we cause harm to others we are responsible for that harm. We cannot say you made me do it. We are responsible for our actions no matter what the other person has done. Do we accept the harm done to us without complaint no matter how harmful it is to us or do we cause harm in return? Is the harm done to our inner being by fighting back greater than the harm done accepting the physical harm to us by doing nothing? In a world where the physical and spiritual have to work together the question of how to balance the two is a central one. It would not be a problem if the human race worked from a position of inner being living in a physical world, but unfortunately this is not the case. There are many unspiritual little gods out there running around causing havoc. This may be a lack of understanding, 
but the result is the same. We are continuously faced with the problem of trying to bring our spiritual being into a hostile physical world. Often this can be in the face of problems that are not of our doing. Sometimes we have played a part in what has gone down but we do not have to accept responsibility for everything. Responsibility for our part is sufficient. Do you want me to give you the answer to this problem? I have no idea. It is a problem that many people find too hard and give up looking for a spiritual path. Each situation is different. The one thing I can say is that as big as a problem maybe there is no need to make it a much bigger problem by trying to take responsibility for the whole thing in the name of spiritual growth. Many of the problems we face are not put there for our spiritual growth. They are vexations of the soul that get in the way of spiritual growth. Learning what is ours and what is not is not only a spiritual learning but can also make life much easier, even in the face of adversity. Thinking without judgment, I meant blame. I have often been asked what thinking without judgment was like. I have to say that I have a feeling of inner peace on the few occasions that I have managed to achieve it I could not say what it was like. I couldn't give any examples as role models. Then I had an assignment comparing the difference in the ways that women's activist groups used social media in the western world and in Asia. That may sound a dry sort of assignment but it was a fascinating subject to research. I decided to use as anchors two women I admire. The first was Glorious Shinem for the Western activist and Ansan Sakai for the Asian activist. They proved to be just the role models I needed. In her role as activist Gloria Steinem simply says what the problem is as she sees it and then opens the discourse in an attempt to find solutions. As a man I have no problem in listening to Gloria Steinem. Often the things she says I hadn't thought of as being problems and I find no blame attached to her words. That is important because if she led off with men are to blame for everything then I would be turned off immediately. The other style of feminism, the Germaine Greer style I reject because it is full of blame. I saw Germaine Greer interviewed by Andrew Denton and the conversation from Greer was that all men are misogynist bastards and if Andrew disagreed with her it was because he was a misogynist bastard. I often find Germaine Greer amusing with her ideas but I can never take her seriously. The reason? Heaping sexist judgments on people is not the way to get someone to listen to what you are saying. I see her now as more as a stand-up comic rather than a serious feminist. She may have caused shock and awe with her first assaults on society but it was the likes of Gloria Steinem that did the hard work. Can you imagine being shut inside your house for 20 years and not allowed to see your family? You captors tell you that you can leave any time but you must leave your country and never return. Aung San Suu Kyi just said no. It took many years but the generals in Burma finally had to listen. That is the power of the word no. After Suu Kyi had been released and allowed to participate in elections she started working with those who had been her captors to bring democracy to Burma. That is thinking without judgment. Democracy in Burma is a long time coming but I think it will be a lasting democracy. It will be a democracy achieved without blame. If it was with blame it would be a democracy achieved though armed conflict and that never leads to a real democracy. Armed uprisings usually end with a new dictator promising elections sometime in the future. I have always wondered how it takes five years to organize an election that never comes. There is hope that a democracy achieved without blame as in Burma cannot really be by the people for the people. Looking back at the instruction do not eat the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil I think I have been using the wrong word. Maybe thinking without blame might be better than thinking without judgment. Judgment is too broad in its meaning. Blame is a judgment, but it has a much narrower meaning. Gloria Steinem speaks and writes without blame. She lays out the problem as she sees it and makes the judgment that she would like things to change. In this sense she is not without judgment, but dialogue does not blame. This allows change to take place. Aung San Suu Kyi I can suffer for years at the will of the generals and then work with them without any expression of blame. 
by just using the word no and working towards outcomes without blame on sense AI has changed the world. This is an example of how the world could change if we stopped blaming each other. What if Israel stopped blaming the Palestinians and the Palestinians stopped blaming Israel? One example of how a human-wide problem could be solved by negotiating without blame. I have always written using the judgment because judgment is the form in which blame becomes manifest in the physical. But I was missing that the sort of judgment I was writing about was the result of the thinking process, not the thinking process that caused the judgment. The thinking process is seeking to assign blame. Thinking without blame means we can make the judgments that we do not want someone in our lives or we want or do not want something. But if that is done without blame there is no need for anger or getting even. No blame no anger, which is possibly why it feels peaceful when it is achieved. And if there is no blame a solution to any problem can be found. My judgment is that the world needs more glorious Tynums and Ansan Sakais of both sexes. I thank them both for their example that has allowed me to see what I was really writing about. There are any number of videos on YouTube featuring Gloria Steinem and Ansan Sakai and they are worth watching to see how they say things rather than what they are saying. Part to right and wrong. Blame can be defined as making judgments about right and wrong. The whole question of right and wrong, and blame is the problem of imprecise language. The two concepts are virtually the same except that right and wrong is a duality and so we have a choice that requires a judgment. If you read any of my past material that uses the word judgment or right and wrong most of the time blame can be substituted. We judge right and wrong and the result is the appropriation of blame. It can be defined the other way around. Blame is the appropriation of right and wrong. Which of the two seems more appropriate is sometimes a difficult decision so in my writings feel free to substitute whatever seem the most appropriate. The concept of right and wrong is a concept that really fouls up the human race. It operates at three levels. The religious level. The legal level. The personal level. We can do anything we like, to anyone at any time and remain free of sin because whatever we are doing is God's will. Terrorism is often an extreme example of this concept. Declare jihad and kill the infidel. In the mind of the perpetrators they are free of sin. The Spanish Inquisition operated on the same principle. The persecution of witches and many other atrocities have occurred by invoking the same format. It goes back to the beginning of time. Whether or not the perpetrators of these acts are doing God's will is problematic. There is a section from Matthew that goes along the lines of you call my name but I do not know you. You say, but Lord, everything I have done I have done in your name. But still I do not know you, for as you do to the least of my creatures, you do unto me. Just because we do something in the name of God does not make it God's will. At the next level down, the legal, goes along the line of we can do anything we want to anyone at any time and provided it is legal, we remain free of sin. Our courts do not operate on justice, or any altruistic concepts. They operate on legality. Stealing from shareholders is okay as long as it is legal. Stitching someone up with an ambiguously worded contract is okay as long as it is done legally. We will see a lot of the legality concept in the next year. When the dust settles on the subprime debacle, and the world recession. The focus will turn to accountability. There will be a lot of it wasn't my fault, it was legal. It will be interesting to see how successful the architects of the subprime market at claiming the legal high ground. The bottom level is right and wrong. We can do anything we like to anyone at any time and provided we are right and they are wrong we remain free of sin. This works before and after the event. Right and wrong before the event is a cynical exercise in creating the other as the wrongdoer before acting. If we want to invade a sovereign country we might invent evidence of that country having weapons of mass destruction. If we do this well we might even convince ourselves that these weapons of mass destruction actually exist. It is interesting that before the invasion of Iraq Bush, 
Blair and Howard spent three weeks proving it was legal. Thus they remain doubly free of sin. Right and wrong, after the event, is finding a reason why we did something that was in hindsight, a mistake. Do we say I made a mistake? No. We find a reason we were right. There is a traffic accident. The driver of the car that hit the other says it was not my fault. I swerved to avoid the hammer that cut across in front of me. This may be true. But very often it is the excuse for driving poorly and no hammer existed, or if it did it did not cut across. But given a short space of time the hammer will exist, and will have cut across, if only in the head of the driver who caused the accident. That driver will, of course, remain free of sin. You lie to your lover. It takes no time at all to find a reason why you were right and it was their fault. Maybe you can find a reason why they deserved it. This is the concept of right and wrong. It is a means by which we can avoid personal responsibility by finding a reason why it is always the fault of someone else. Give a little practice it is possible to do anything you want to any, at any time and place, and remain free of sin under all circumstances. This using right and wrong, or blame, goes back at least as far as the writers of Genesis. God said who did this? It wasn't me it was her said Adam. It wasn't me it was snake said Eve. And poor snake at the bottom of the chain cops the lot. But God made it clear that none of them could escape responsibilities for their actions. That's the bad news. No matter how many reasons we may find to pass off our sin onto others by using blame we all remain responsible for our actions. Being harmless. There is an ancient Greek philosophy that begins and ends within the first place, cause no harm. In the second place, cause no harm. In the third place causes no harm. In the various version of the witches read from the ancient Wicca religion there is the line if it harms none, do as you will. This is one of the cornerstones of a successful spiritual path. From the very begins of philosophies there has been the concept of living in unison with everything that the incomprehensible God has created. It is the origins of Taoism, the basis of the pagan earth religions and the basics of Wicca. Many Eastern traditions are based on the same principles. Today we have pollution, global warming, destruction of the environment and many other problems associated with our forgetting to be harmless. The idea of looking after our planet and all creatures on it goes back to the ancient religions. If a person joins a rally to try to bring about changes to combat global warming they are behaving in accordance with Wicca or pagan principles. It is possible that if the ideals of Wicca and Paganism had not been eliminated, often violently, from our society we would not have a problem with global warming, we would not have polluted our planet in the first place. What is often missed is that the Christian and Jewish religions start with Adam being created by God to care for this planet and all creatures on it. What happened? We discover judgment, greed and illusions of power. Being harmless takes many forms. It manifests in our daily lives and in our relationships. It also manifests in the relationship we have with the planet we live on. The idea that doing nothing is being harmless is not valid. In the Sermon on the Mount the example of a man divorcing his wife, Jesus taught that we are not responsible for another's action. But Jesus followed that by saying that if we aid, or do nothing, we are as responsible for the person's actions as they are. Standing by and watching another commit a harmful act is as harmful as the original act. It is a part of the spiritual path to learn when to act and when not to act. We need to learn to understand the difference between personal choice and what is harmful. Maybe someone has a lifestyle that is different from ours. That is nothing to do with us. If it causes no harm it is nothing to do with anyone else except the person concerned, even if religious leaders or others label it sinful. If we try to impose our way of life on others we are causing harm. If a company pumps large quantities of carbon into the atmosphere it is harmful, to our planet and to us. If a dictator in Africa drives his country into poverty and disease it is our place to act. 
part of the reason for our being here is to look after the planet and all on it. Poverty is harmful. Following a spiritual path has its obligations. Part of those obligations is to understand what is required of us. Being harmless is one of those obligations. If a person professes to be spiritual and continues to cause harm they are a hypocrite. The spiritual path is a personal journey, but there are some things that are a part of many people looking in the same direction. One of those commonalities is the need to be harmless and to do what we can to combat harmful behavior. What we do in the external world is as important as the internal journey. Cognitive Dissonance The art of ignoring what we don't want to know. The human race is supposed to be rational. The human race is supposed to look at all the available information and make decisions based on rational analysis. That just does not happen. What really happens is that we live by paradigms. A paradigm is a world view. We live in societies that have a particular world view. If a person lives according to a Christian paradigm they have a different perception of the world to someone who lives according to an Islamic paradigm. There is nothing rational about either, or any other paradigm. If we lived our rationally our paradigms would be in a constant state of flux, being continuously modified as each new piece of rational information is added. That just does not happen. What does happen is cognitive dissonance as each new piece of information is added. Cognitive is basically perception, and dissonance is conflict. It would be helpful if psychologists spoke English. But since cognitive dissonance is the official terminology I had better stick to it. We have a paradigm that has been created by our society, or some subgroup of our society. It is unlikely that our paradigm has any basis in the rational. There is nothing in the concept of a paradigm that dictates that it needs to be rational other than to support a paradigm that cannot be supported in any other way. Another, less polite way of defining paradigm is groupthink, where a group thinks as one and the individual conforms to an official form of thinking. Groupthink would be used to describe the behavior of the German people in the Nazi years when the individual became an instrument of the state. We are much more polite than that so we live according to paradigms. The result of cognitive dissonance, individually and collectively, is to be completely blind to anything that conflicts with our paradigm. If we ignore it, it will go away. We have a western paradigm that relies heavily on an oil-based society. If we ignore global warming long enough it will go away. This is an example of how rationality has no place in our paradigms. This of course will cause conflict. There are those who want to upset our paradigm by bringing changes that may or may not be rational. Cleaning up the planet may be rational but so far the advocates of curbing carbon emissions have so far only created cognitive dissonance, not a paradigm shift. A paradigm shift occurs when cognitive dissonance becomes too great to ignore and the old paradigm is overthrown. A paradigm shift is not rational. It is not evolutionary, it is revolutionary. It involves major conflict. Sometimes paradigm shifts are bloodless, and sometimes bloody, but as with physical revolutions the new dictator often becomes as despotic as the old. A paradigm shift will throw out the good with the bad. Everything is destroyed to make way for the new. We need to shift our attitudes to pollution and other environmental attitudes. There is an urgent need to look at our contribution to conflict around the world. There are many other things that need to be done, but not everything about our present paradigm is bad. What has this to do with spirituality? Everything. The spiritual movement is filled with literature about the need for a paradigm shift. How a new consciousness or awakening is going to sweep away the old and make the human race bright and shiny again. This revolutionary attitude will not cure all our ills any more than the Bolshevik export peace and prosperity to Russia. Many who follow a spiritual path seek or expect a moment of enlightenment, a flash of understanding that changes their paradigm forever. If we follow this way we ignore everything we don't want to know about until it will just not go away. Then the old is destroyed by the new. Whether or not this enlightened state will be any better than the old paradigm is debatable. 
not everything in our unenlightened state is bad, but it will all be destroyed? What is the way forward? Be aware of cognitive dissonance. Be aware that we all have a habit of ignoring what we don't want to know about. Ask yourself if you want a truth or a truth you will like. The two are not always the same. If you decide you want truth don't dismiss something just because you don't like it. Instead look at what it holds for you. You might decide to accept it or reject it. It is likely that you will neither accept or reject. Instead the probability is that whatever it holds of value to you will be assimilated and new paradigm becomes evolutionary rather than revolutionary. Remember the old advice that a journey begins with a single step. Each place along the way is another first step. Enlightenment is a journey of little steps, not a blinding flash of light. As a writer on spiritual concepts cognitive dissonance has a special meaning to me. If I write close to the existing spiritual paradigm, that hasn't shifted in 30 years, same book, different author, lots of people read what I write. If I push the boundaries cognitive dissonance kicks in and I am ignored. This can be frustrating but is all part of the process until evolutionary paradigms take over from revolutionary paradigms. Hopefully people seeking a spiritual path can come understand that a little small step at a time outside the safety zone will not cause the sky to fall in. That small step soon becomes comfortable is assimilated into the safety zone, and it is time for the next small step. Learning how to overcome cognitive dissonance is one of those small steps and leads to our spiritual path becoming enjoyable and evolutionary rather than filled with drama and conflict. The Garden of Eden Incident Can Genesis in the Bible be read to mean something completely differently that the various forms of poly and Christianity deem it to be? Yes it can, and if it is read literally the meaning is surprising. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him, male and female he created he them. Genesis 127 KJV this was long before Adam and Eve so Adam was not the first man what was the purpose of man? To have dominion over the earth and everything that lived on it. Basically man was God's caretaker. It is interesting that according the Genesis that at this stage man and all the animals were vegetarian. With man as his caretaker and everything ticking over nicely God could take a rest. But God did not leave it there, and Genesis continues with a contradiction. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Genesis 27 KJV. If man, male and female, already existed this could be God giving man a soul. We had progressed from one of the animals to having a soul. The next section of Genesis, from chapter 2 verses 8 to 14 describes how God created the Garden of Eden. Surprisingly from such a detailed description there is no place on earth that has the physical features of the Garden of Eden. But there is one place that fits. That place is the human brain. The circular river flowing out into four lands is a match for the circle of Willis, the blood supply to the human brain. Man suddenly becomes Adam. No reason given or suggestion be for this that man had a name. Not surprising since man was the generic name covering both male and female. It is Adam who is placed in the center of the Garden of Eden. It could be that Adam is the name given to the newly created soul, and that the soul was placed in the center of the human brain. This would be about the position of the third eye of Eastern religions. There is progression here. We start with a humanoid whose purpose is to look after the planet for God. We then progress to humanoid with a soul place at the center of a developed brain. We are not yet at the human stage as we know it. The next step comes with the naming of the animals. And Adam gave names to all the cattle, and to all the fowl of the air, and of every beast in the field, but for Adam there was not found a help meet for him. Genesis 220 KJV the book of J version is much clearer than the Christian Old Testament at this point. It is not good for man to be alone, 
said Yahweh, I will make a partner to stand beside him so Yahweh shaped out of the soil all the creatures of the field and birds of the air to see how he would call them. Whatever the man called became the creature's name. Soon all wild animals had names the man gave them, all birds of the air, and creatures of the field, but the man did not his partner amongst them. Part of Chapter 4, Book of J translated by David Rosenberg, Vintage, New York, 1990. Man was no longer one of the animals and he was lonely. But man is the generic name. There were others, male and female, so loneliness should not have been a problem. This must have been a special loneliness. If it was Adam that was lonely then it is the soul that was lonely. The soul needed a partner. Why would the soul need a partner? My hypothesis is that with a single soul man's consciousness would have been external. Man's only source of reference was the animals and birds but this was not enough. The soul needed a source of reference so that it could know itself. So woman was created from Adam's life, an alternative translation to rib. Woman would have been an exact clone of Adam. Man now had an internal mirror. The soul called Adam would know itself because it could see Eve. The soul called woman would know itself because it could see Adam. Man was now conscious of itself from within because the soul now had a partner. There is no mention of Eve in the whole story. Eve only appears later as a wife who became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. So man was now internally conscious. Man now knew the meaning of I. Therefore shall a man a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be as one flesh. Genesis 224 KJV. Man has now moved on and left its heritage behind. Men is now unique in that it is a fully internally conscious species. They have each other but are separate from its half-conscious forebearers. In the center of the garden, the human brain, are two trees, the tree of life, the connection to all life, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, judgment. The only thing we must not do is judge good and evil. There is a reason for this. The twin soul system of internal consciousness is very elegant. It is an almost perfect system with only one weakness. If the souls start judging each other the system self-destructs. As the souls start judging each other the perfect mirror is lost. There is still an internal mirror but it is a mirror of conflict and the twin souls degenerate into what we know as the soul and the ego at war with each other. The final move is for God to move the souls out of the center of the brain to the right hemisphere so that they do not interfere with the tree of life. So why did the souls start to judge? My guess is that there was one thing missing. We did not have an innate sense of self. We know we existed as a separate entity but had no idea who that entity was. There are three questions that caught us out. Who am I? How did I get here? Why am I here? Given these three unanswerable questions it was inevitable that we should judge and invent religion, philosophy, race, creed, color, nationality and sexism in an effort to give ourselves some form of identity. Ego is not a dirty word. There is emphasis on busting the ego in many areas of spiritual seeking. The current Buddhist fashion is busting the ego. The Buddhists are not alone here, it is a fad that has been around for a long time. The concept of the ego is a little over 100 years old. It came from Sigmund Freud's work on the unconscious. Ego was one of the three entities in the unconscious that Freud used to explain human behavior. In a spiritual context it is more usual to refer to two entities, the soul and the ego. The soul is usually good and the ego bad. There is sufficient evidence in the area of split brain theory pioneered by Roger Sperry and Michael Gazenegger to say there are two entities in the human brain that are independently conscious. For the purposes of this article I will use the common names of the soul and the ego. If we have a soul and an ego there is either a reason for it or it is a biological sick joke. There does seem to be a reason for the soul and the ego, and that reason is consciousness. If we only had a soul everything we would be conscious of would be external. Consciousness requires a duality. 
it needs a mirror. If we only had a soul we would only have an external mirror, the world around us. This might be the way that animals are conscious. They could see everything around them and not see themselves as separate. The human race does see itself as separate entities. We do have an inner consciousness of self. I am me, you are you and even the closest of marriages cannot merge two people into one. We see ourselves as unique individuals because we have an internal mirror. That is the role of the soul and the ego. They provide an internal mirror that gives us our internal consciousness. The problem is not that they exist, but that they are usually fighting each other. If the soul and the ego were to become identical and at peace with each other we would not be aware of any internal conflict. We would know ourselves and be at peace. If we could reach this state we would not be aware of the separate entities of the soul and the ego. They would seem to be one. This would be the perfect internal mirror. The soul would know the soul by seeing the ego. The ego would know the ego by knowing the soul, and we would know ourselves through a feeling of internal peace. Since both are necessary for us to be human we cannot make judgments about either being good or bad. Busting the ego will bring us peace. It will be the peace of the comatose with no awareness of self. If internal peace with internal consciousness is what is desired, the way to go is to heal the rift between the soul and the ego. The way to start that process is to stop threatening the ego and praising the soul. They are equal and need to be treated as equals. The core issue in following a spiritual path is healing the rift between the soul and the ego. It is a strange sort of rift because it is a rift between us and ourself. It is an internal rift, and when we are doing any sort of healing work to heal past or present problems this is what we are doing. We are reconciling the soul and the ego. This is essential because until the problem has led to an outcome that is acceptable to both the soul and the ego there will be internal conflict over the issue. The soul and the ego as the two entities found by Sperry and Gazzaniga can be seen as separate personalities that can have different reactions to the same situation. Reconciling the differences between the soul and the ego is something that needs to be done every time something happens that disturbs our inner peace. When that is achieved we can find inner peace and move on. Enlightenment. What is it? Enlightenment is one of those concepts that is so nebulous that it means many different things to different people. Often the concept of enlightenment involves images of an old man sitting cross-legged in a cave halfway up a mountain. The old man has spent a lifetime meditating, and at this advanced age he sits motionless with a smile on his face because he has realized the secrets of the universe. If this is enlightenment what use is it? Is the point of following a spiritual path to become pleasantly comatose whilst the world disintegrates around you? Or do we need to bring our understanding into the world? One of the things that Jesus said is relevant here. If you bring forth what is within, it will save you. If you do not bring forth what is within it will destroy you. Enlightenment is to be brought forth, not hidden behind a knowing smile. The path I follow dictates that as I understand things I bring them into the world. My little bit added to all the little bits contributed by many others just might make a difference. So enlightenment is to be savored, enjoyed and used. But what is it? Enlightenment is not a thing, or a state or anything lasting. It is a fleeting moment. Have you ever had a problem or puzzle that has no answer? Then the light goes on with a flick of the switch. Not only do you have answer, it is the only answer that could have been. It is an answer that you don't have to remember because it becomes one of the things that are simply known and cannot be unknown. You assimilate it into your being. That is true enlightenment. No big event. No bands of trumpet blowing angels welcoming a new master into heaven. Just a little fleeting moment that changes you in an imperceivable way. It is a flick of a switch that shines just a little more light on life. With each little moment of enlightenment life changes in an almost imperceivable way. The world has changed fractionally. Enlightenment is not to be kept for oneself. It cannot be because a true moment of enlightenment changes a person forever, and that change shows. 
there is probably not going to be any massive event of total understanding on the spiritual path. Instead it will be a massive change over time that goes almost unnoticed because it is some of many little moments of enlightenment that came and went. Escape the trap of judgment. Every day for the last six and a half thousand years there has been war, greed, poverty, oppression and genocide. The daily lives of many people are the same on a smaller scale. The difference between world affairs and what will take part in today is often only a matter of degree. Why does the human race live this way? The answer that is given in old religious and philosophical writings is surprisingly constant. Invariably judgment comes into it. From Genesis we have do not eat the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The Jewish book of J says the same. Taoist philosophy gives many warning against judgment. There are countless other examples. Is the meaning being missed because judgment can mean so many different things in the English language? Is there a special type of judgment that fouls up the way we think and behave? Toxic judgment. If we do not know something we make a wild guess and claim that our wild guess is true. This is toxic judgment. It is toxic because our wild guesses are not true. They are not related to reality. If people act on their toxic judgment the results will never be what they intended. How can they be? Their judgment is only a wild guess and has no reality attached to it. The results will have nothing to do with the reality of what was intended. The two types of toxic judgment. The first type of toxic judgment is claiming something to be false because it cannot be proved to be true. Scientists say there is no proof of any harm in genetic engineering therefore genetic engineering is safe. The first part of that statement is true. There is no proof that genetic is harmful is true. But any harm there is in genetic engineering has not been invented yet. Any harm that exists in any new technology does not exist until the technology is introduced so there can be no proof of harm until the harm is invented. There was no proof that the auto industry would cause pollution because before Henry Ford that pollution did not exist. All new technologies can have major unforeseen side effects. The second type of toxic judgmental is the reverse. It is claiming something to be true because it cannot be proved false. Someone robs a bank and gets caught. They are tried, found guilty and thrown in jail. I see no problem with this. But often people are found guilty and thrown in jail because someone said they were thinking about robbing a bank. How often have you been tried and found guilty for something someone said you were thinking about? This includes assigning attitudes and motivation, judging what someone wanted or were trying to do. How often have you done the same to someone else? The way forward. There is a way out. It is both easy and hard at the same time. Be aware of the form of information you are receiving. If something is true can it be shown to be true, or merely unable to be shown to be false? If something is false can it be shown to be false or merely unable to be shown to be true? Come to recognize these forms of communication and avoid them, both from without and within. If a person can do this their decisions have a reasonable prospect of working as intended because they will be reality based. Holding on to your essential essence in difficult times. What is the essential essence has been a question asked by philosophers since the beginning of history. It is a question that has fundamental meaning but is very difficult to answer. Descartes gave one of the most famous treaties on finding true essence. In Descartes example he used wax. Here is a candle. It is made of wax that is solid and keeps its form. The candle is lit and the wax melts and runs, but is still wax. Water can be vapor, it can be liquid and it can be solid depending on temperature, but it is still water. In modern times we could explain physical properties in terms of chemical properties, but this is not possible for people. There are many stages which a person can go through but this is not the essence of that person. What is it that makes a person a unique and indivisible identity? Somewhere inside us all is a little quiet voice that is different and unique. That does not mean that there are not similarities, 
but the mix of similarities is different for each of us. That little voice is our true essence and is there to guide us if only we can listen. You might be with a group of people that are laughing and joking together. Someone says something and you all laugh. But your little voice says it doesn't like what is said even though you laugh with the others. You hear sexist or racist comments and inside you cringe, but you laugh anyway. It is not always possible to avoid these sorts of situations. You might enjoy a sport or hobby and there is a wide mix of people involved. There is often no way of controlling the people we work with. But we can listen to our inner essence and quietly move away. No need to fight a battle you cannot win. There are other ways of changing the world you live in. If we listen and move away from situations and people our inner voice does not like and towards people we do we will find ourselves guided to people with similar essence. Not the same but similar. In this sort of situation it is much easier to listen to our inner essence. While we are busy conforming or repelling to situations we do not like it is hard to listen to who we are. We get lost in internal conflict, and internal conflict is death to essence. Your essence is that part of you that cannot be reduced. You might lose your job in the present economic climate, although I hope you don't. There could be conflict with loved ones in difficult times. None of these things need be catastrophic because your essence will remain. Stay calm and hear your true self. I was moved to write this article by the acceptance speech of Barack Obama. Replace fear with hope. One of the things often common to people who are following a spiritual path is that they have known difficult times and that is how they have come to be on this path. They have found that there is more than the material world. There is the unseen that helps and guides us through communicating with our essence and has proved over and over the old saying from Pharaoh Akhenaten this too will pass also. These are times for having faith in your spiritual path and trusting your essence. It is easy to have faith when times are good, but to hold on in difficult times is the real test. Be quiet, be still and listen to your essence. Replace fear with hope. Victim of fate, or creator of destiny. Fate and destiny are two words that often get mixed up. Fate is what happens to people when they do nothing. Fate is the result of being a blob that gets pushed around by whatever is happening in the world around them. Living by fate means that at school a person will fall into whatever crowd is available. They join gangs through peer group pressure. They marry because someone is available or some asks them. Children arrive by accident. And when they die they get deposited in a convenient place and their grave quickly fall into disrepair. It is like they had never been here. Fate dictates the work they do by taking whatever is available. There is no seeking what a person would like to do. Destiny, however, is the result of making choices. For some reason there seems to be children born who just know how to make choices. When they go to school they actively seek activities that mean something to them. The groups that they belong to reflect the person they are. If a person who follows their destiny marries they marry to form a complete union with another person. Their children become part of the union. And when they die they are remembered long after they have physically departed. Often there is a mixture of both in a person's life. Is something the place they are in the result of fate or was it chosen? We have all ended up in places that have been the result of taking the line of least resistance. Getting out again is often hard and painful. Fate can be very hard on a person. The good news is that it is never too late. Anyone can decide to start making choices and take control of their destiny. Because you are reading this little article in a place about spirituality I am going to guess that you are searching for something better. I am making that guess because that is a very common reason for being here. It is either fate or destiny that has brought you here depending on if you drifted here or came here through choice. The thing to remember is that no matter how much you know or how much you have learnt it will remain unfulfilled until your new understanding is used to make active choices. That is how you create destiny. You choose it. Enjoy your destiny, it is much more fun than being pushed around by fate.
sorting reality from illusion. Everything is an illusion according to many forms of philosophy and spiritual inquiry. This line of argument goes along several paths. One is that reality is only a dream and that we are some sort of spiritual entity dreaming a script to learn lessons. Another is along the lines that the whole universe is a hologram and that substance does not exist. The one I like is the reverse of Descartes I think therefore I am this version is I am because I think. We are nothing more than an intelligence that thinks up a reality so it can get around. That one has interesting possibilities. The idea of the world being an illusion goes back thousands of years. It was popular amongst Roman philosophers and seems to be part of the Tao Te Ching. I say seems to be because the Tao Te Ching is almost an illusion in itself. Much of it can be whatever you want it to be. Over the years the meaning of the illusion seems to have been corrupted out of all recognition to the original intent. The original meaning of the illusion was that it is the value we place on reality that is the illusion. The idea that material possessions equals success and power is the sort of illusion the old writing referred to. A big house is a big house. That is not an illusion. The idea that the owner of the house must be special and important is the illusion. A president of a country must be special to become president. That is an illusion. There are many ways of becoming president of a country, and few of them require anything more than being ruthless. A person's job or profession defines their intelligence. That is an illusion. There are plenty of over-educated airheads in charge of very large corporations. Position has nothing to do with intelligence. One of the most blatant examples of illusion is that a person's physical body in some way defines whether or not they are sexy. And as a result lots of very important people make lots of money selling products that are supposed to make us conform to the illusion. Illusion feeds on illusion. This is the illusion of reality that a person following a spiritual path will have to confront at some time. It is fundamental that we must go past the illusion. This does not mean that we have to be poor, ugly, or a doormat. What it means is that the idea that physical reality has any more meaning than just being. A house is a house, a flower is a flower and a person is a person. A person's position or wealth in no way defines the value. It is impossible to say a person is worth three billion dollars. A person's worth cannot be defined in money. Money is only a means of exchange so does that mean that this person can be exchanged for three billion little bits of paper? In that case a person can be bought and sold. Worth no more than a slave. Our worth depends on who we are. Who we are creates the physical world we live in. The world is just the world, what we do with it is what we create. Our worth is defined by our actions. By your actions you are known Jesus. Do you create love or hate? Do you create plenty or poverty? Do you look after this planet or pollute it? These are things that will define who you are, not the illusions created by your physical possessions or lack of them. But as soon as you place importance on yourself because of what you do the illusion returns. Worth come from within, and that is the worth worth having. Making the improbable a certainty. Richard Feynman, the great quantum physicist and educator said in one of his lectures that just because something is possible does not mean it is probable. This is the same concept as my earlier article The Judgment Trap. So often we claim something is true because it is possible, and that something is untrue because improbable. The truth is if something is true it is true no matter improbable it is. And, in reverse untrue is untrue no matter how probable it seems. If there is no proof either way it remains a probability. We spend our lives looking for certainty and yet all we have is varying degrees of probability. Virtually nothing can be proved conclusively one way or the other. In Douglas Adams' book, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Universe, there is a spaceship that has a propulsion unit called the improbability drive. The way it works is that, if the pilot of the spaceship wants to be somewhere, he works out the improbability of being there and feeds this calculation into the improbability drive, and he is there. Everything in our lives is improbable. Starting from your parents and place of birth, 
try to use statistical analyzers to work out the probability of you being where you are now. The improbability will be infinite, but here you are. That is why you are where you are, because it is totally improbable. Suppose that you were somewhere else. That would be equally improbable. Every single thing that we are, and where we are, is infinitely improbable. We are where we are now because this is the improbability we have chosen. Let's put a number on this and say that the probability of us being where we are now is a billion to one against. How do we use the improbability of anything to make what we want a certainty? If you see that the probability of any of the other things that could have happened happening is also one billion to one against, then the probability of any of the billion options is equal. The probability of what you want is the same as the probability of anything else. The probability of what you want is equal to the probability of what you don't want. Given an equal choice out of all the improbable things that could happen all we have to do is to choose what we do want to make it a certainty. It works every time provided we are not logical about it. But as soon as we are logical about it, and decide that something cannot happen because it is totally improbable, we make it impossible. It does not matter how improbable something may seem, it has an equal probability with everything else, and all we have to do to make it actual is to choose it. The act of choosing changes the probability of that one possibility into a certainty. Douglas Adams' improbability drive is the same logic, or lack of it. Where you want to be is highly improbable, but so is being anywhere else. So why not choose where you want to be and be there? Another way to look at it is as a lottery with a billion tickets. The odds of any one person winning are one billion to one against, but the odds of someone winning are a certainty. How can we tip the odds? By choosing what we want. The problem with being on a spiritual path is not lack. We can create anything we want. The problem is learning what we really want and choosing it. It really is that simple, and that hard. There is a conversation in Alice in Wonderland I like. Where am I said Alice. Where do you want to be said the rabbit. I don't know Alice replied. Then said the rabbit, what does it matter where you are. That is the real problem. We can have everything we want just by choosing it, but what do we want. The purpose of our spiritual path is to find out who we are and what we want. If we can work that one out the rest is easy. Is it logical? One of the most common criticisms that a person on a spiritual path will encounter is that it is not logical. Somehow this call to the higher power of logic has the power to negate anything the logical person wants to negate. The process is very simple. The act of calling something not logical demands the response of proving that it is logical. The counter argument will be rejected because the reply will not be logical and therefore it is wrong. This form of argument is a misuse of logic, and shows a lack of understanding about the nature of logic. Logic is the justification of a predetermined prejudice. The purpose of logic is to find a way to justifying whatever end result is required. If an engineer designs the structure of a building he slash she will start at the end. How big will the building be? How much will it weigh? What will the wind loads be on the building? Will the ground it is to be built on support the building? From this point the engineer will work backwards from the big to the detail. Eventually the engineer will arrive at the very beginning where a set of plans and specifications can be given to the builder. The builder then starts at the beginning and works forward until the building is completed. Logic is the art of working backwards from where you want to be to find where you must start from to get to where you want to be. If something is attacked for not being logical it means nothing because the predetermined prejudice has been defined to be somewhere else. Logic can only prove something that has already been predefined. If I wanted to prove white people were smarter than Afro-Americans that is the prejudice I would start with. If I wanted to prove Afro-Americans were smarter than white people I would start with that as my prejudice. The starting point established by working backwards from each prejudice would be different. By using the different starting points I can prove whatever prejudice I want to prove. Used in this way logic is very dangerous. It can be used to prove anything. 
but used correctly logic is a beautiful tool. What do you want? Where do you want to be? Let that be you predetermined prejudiced. When used in this context prejudice is not a dirty word. From there work backwards from there to here to understand how to get from where you are to where you want to be. Working forward again from here it is logical that you will end up where you want to. Logic used correctly can take us to heaven. Used incorrectly it can take us to hell. It is possibly the most powerful tool invented by the human race. It has to understood and used correctly if the outcomes we want are to materialize. What makes a master? Master is a word that is used in many ways. For those seeking a spiritual path there are two legitimate meanings. Often people confuse one meaning with the other. The first meaning of master is that a person has achieved a level of proficiency. They are masters in areas such as Reiki or other forms of massage manipulation or anything requiring manual techniques. In seafaring there is the master mariner, who is to be respected for the level and skill they have achieved. This is the same concept. This does not mean that a master in this sense deserves to be credited with any higher spiritual achievements because of their manual skills. They are good at their job. The other form of master is someone who has achieved a degree of spiritual progress that lifts him slash her above the other seekers. This is a quality that cannot be defined. One thing that you can count on is that if someone tells you that they are a master they are not. One of the attributes of a master that comes through from old spiritual philosophies such as Tao is that a master is without judgment. As soon as someone makes the judgment that they are a master then they cannot be. So how do you know if you meet a master? You probably never will. But here are some clues. A master teaches without teaching. Have you ever been with someone and had an intuitive understanding without them telling you? A master will know that the only learning of value will be the learning you have taught yourself. Knowing comes from the head. Understanding comes from the heart. Understanding is felt. A master will help you feel the answer rather than tell you the answer. A master does not force things to happen. A master works with what is in the present moment. Life is to be guided not forced. Going with the flow does not mean doing nothing. It means understanding what can be done and what cannot be done. A master understands that this moment is all there is. If there is something that needs to be done now, then do it. If it does not need to be done now, then leave it alone. A master never does something simply because he slash she can. A very small movement can back a big change when it multiplies. A master can change everything by seemingly doing nothing. They have done something but it was too small to notice. The problem with recognizing a master is that they are not always a master. Teaching without teaching is something that very delicate. Sometimes it can be done and sometimes it misses. When it works you are a master. When it doesn't you are not. For anyone to claim that they can achieve this level all the time is arrogance. It cannot be achieved in human form. If we achieved it we would no longer be human. All of us are masters some of the time, none of us all the time. The best we can achieve if we aspire to follow a spiritual path is to learn to do what we can when we can, and recognize when to do nothing. And in some moments we will be masters. That is enough for one lifetime. Restoration of the mind. This article is about a car because I am a bit of a petrol head. Like the book Zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance it could be about anything, because it is the essence of the story that matters. I could have made this story about a lion tamer, and that would have been just as appropriate. Suppose we find a really rare and desirable old car, something like a 64 Mercedes gull wing, at an old farm covered in dirty, bits missing and a real mess. We buy it for next to nothing clear out the chickens and the hay and tow it home to our garage. For the next 20 years we spend thousands of hours lovingly restoring it to its original showroom condition. It is now perfect. Now it is decision time. Do we to sit cross-legged in the corner contemplating its magnificence and beauty, and wait for it to do something? 
or do we open up the garage door, start the engine and take it out to see what it can do? I am, of course, referring to the human mind. We have spent years on the spiritual path getting our brain into good condition. You may not think of it that way but that is how it is. Progressing along a spiritual path naturally repairs our damaged minds. The mind, in good condition, is passive, like the Mercedes in the garage. It waits for us to start the engine and tell it what we want. It then goes and gets it for us. It will guide us to anything we want. But it will wait passively until the engine is started. There is a stage where we need to decide what we want. Not what we are told we are supposed to want, but what we really want. Then the mind will take us there. The alternative is to sit cross-legged in the corner contemplating the beauty and waiting for the mind to do something while the mind is sitting cross-legged looking back waiting to be told what to do. The real benefit of learning to meditate and taming the mind is to bring the mind to the place where it will be calm and wait for instructions instead of going its own way with us running after it trying to minimize the damage. As in all things spiritual there is no need to wait until we reach perfect before we start using what we have gained. We calm our minds a little bit. We can start using it a little bit. It calms some more so we can use it some more, and so on, until we reach the stage where we are using our minds to create what we want instead of our minds using us to create what we don't want. Avoiding old age. First the bad news. There is nothing that is going to stop the advance of physical old age. Physically we can grow old gracefully, we can use plastic surgery to pretend we are not growing old, we can grow old healthily or we can go down kicking and screaming, but we will grow physically old. The old age that can be avoided is the old age that brings redundancy. The old age that means there is nothing more to contribute. This is a very sad form of old age because it means we are redundant, surplus to requirements. This form of old age can be avoided, and those that follow a spiritual path have probably already learned many of the skills necessary to avoid it. It is an essential part of the spiritual path that what we do in the physical world remains relevant. It is essential to our inner growth that we remain relevant. The alternative is to sit cross-legged in a cave meditating in the delusion that this will bring us closer to God. We have this thing called a belief system. Many people believe we are supposed to have a belief system, we are not. The belief system is just a mess of judgments that leaves us stuck in one place. During our formative year we are bombarded with judgments. These judgments come from our parents, from our teachers and from society in general. Some of these judgments stick and some don't. At some point, usually around late teens or early adulthood, the judgments that have stuck congeal into a blob. That blob of judgments we dignify by calling it a belief system. The result is that is unless we do something about it wherever we are when the belief system congeals is where we are stuck for the rest of our lives. We are stuck running on automatic according to our fixed judgments in a place that no longer exists. The 1960s were a lot of fun for many who were there. But those who remain stuck there have become irrelevant fossils, and they tend to start every sentence with when I was young. This is what real old age is. It is the difference between when where we are stuck and the present moment. The faster the world changes the quicker people get old even if they live longer. If a person is stuck in the 60s they are 50 years past their use by date. If they are stuck in the 70s they are 40 years past their use by date. The way not to grow old and remain relevant in today's world is to continuously update the use by date. Things are not better or worse than they used to be, just different. The faster technology and the world changes the faster we grow old unless we work at staying with what is happening now. A few years not keeping up can make us out of date very quickly. The skills that are needed to keep up are the same basic skills that are learnt in following a spiritual path, or a self-help program. Let go and move on. The world is continuously changing. Keeping up is a continuous process of letting go and moving. It isn't hard, 
just takes a little practice. The prize is that you will not grow old because you will remain relevant in the world that exists today. Also your spiritual path will not end up stuck in a backwater. A closely related issue is stasis, which will be the subject of another article. Paradox. The way to personal power is to accept powerlessness. The way to abundance is to detach from the material. If someone special is to remain in our life they need to be free to leave. Paradox after paradox emerges from personal growth and metaphysical inquiry. At least that is the way it seems to be. The greatest paradox of all is that there is no paradox. All paradox comes from the belief that there is separation between the physical self and the spiritual self. When we believe ourselves to be physical, and only physical, then all information is processed as a reaction to outside influences. Information that comes in about outside events is processed from a defensive stance of fear, shame and aloneness. Our reaction is to throw our response defiantly back at the world. Where there is no separation of self, information from outside is carried through our physical being the spiritual being within. Then answers based on inner knowing come back to the physical being and we act on these answers in the outside world. In the first case, answers are a reaction to a seemingly hostile environment, whilst in the second they come from within, as guidance rather than reaction. Is it any wonder then that, with answers coming from opposite directions, there is an appearance of paradox? The basic problem is that we, the human race, work back to front. Something happens outside, we make a judgment in the cognitive brain that the event is good or bad, and then apply a standard answer to the event. No free will. We just react to everything that happens with a standard right or wrong decision, and the consequences that follow are beyond our control. War is an automatic consequence of judging right and wrong. So are greed, poverty and prejudice. We have no free will to change the consequence until we forget right and wrong. If the event is seen without judgment we can then decide what consequences we want, and our inner knowing will guide us to those consequences. The judgment of right and wrong is a barrier between the physical world and our real self. We are not our brains, we are not our belief system, we are who we are, the ghost in the machine. When our brains make judgments about right and wrong we cannot be heard. The brain simply does not allow our will to be heard in the physical world. Paradox. We do what we think is right and the results are not what we want. Everybody is right, nobody gets what they want. This is the result of back to front thinking. We never get what we want, we can never be happy. Working the other way around changes that. The first thing that changes is that the person is free to decide what they really want rather than what the outside world tells them they should want. That is a major step forward. The ghost now controls the machine, no longer is it the machine trying to control the outside world without reference to the self, another name for the ghost in the machine. Having found that what we really want is often quite different from what we are told we want we can decide how to bring about the consequences we do want. Often what we need to do is opposite to what we think we should do. Follow your intuition. Paradox. Intuition is seen as a funny sort of feeling from within. We often ignore it and later find we should have listened. It is seen somehow as a mysterious thing. The reality is that intuition is not at all mysterious. It is the self trying to get past all the mind chatter of right and wrong. We do not have intuition, intuition is communication from ourselves trying to get past the mind chatter about right and wrong. The paradox is that once we learn to listen and act on our intuition it goes away. The funny feeling only comes when we are going to act in a way that is contrary to what we really want. Once we listen to what we really want there is no need to have a funny little feeling as a warning. We become who we are already. What is reality? Reality is a concept that has plagued the human race since the beginning of history. Philosophy is all about reality. It is the eternal search of religions to provide the answer to that one question. The search for reality is the same as the three fundamental questions. Who am I? 
How did I get here? Why am I here? The millions upon millions of words that philosophers have written are all related to those three questions. Reality is the combinations of the three questions, who am I, how did I get here and why am I here into one word. Someone on a spiritual path is on a search for the answer to that basic reality question. The Wall Street trader is searching in a different way, but it is the same search. Power and greed have the same base. We need some reality to tell us who we are. We are all searching, but in different ways. The difference between a CEO earning M$10 a year and a Buddhist monk is very little. They are both searching in their own way. Both need a reason for existing. The small difference is that the CEO may not realize it is all a search for reality whilst the Buddhist monk might. Reality exists on many levels. At what we perceive as the physical level if we can bump into it, it is real. This level of reality has no meaning. It simply is. We can manipulate it to make physical life more comfortable, or less so for others, as in war, but it has no intrinsic meaning. We have preferences. We might prefer to be warm rather than cold. We might prefer not to be hungry. But these are only physical preferences. Physicality is real and not real at the same time. It is real in the sense that it exists, but is not real in that it does not answer the reality question. So where does reality exist? It exists within. It is simply our being that still exists when we can get rid of all the garbage. I am who I am. All three reality questions are answered when the I am statement is understood. That is why the inner journey is getting rid of the garbage so we can see what we already know. You cannot be told that what you already know. You can only see it for yourself. Then you will know reality. The ultimate challenge is to bring the I am into the physical world. To create a physical world that reflects the inner world. Then we will know reality because we will have created it in our own image. What is reality for the human race? We shall never know until we create it. Can we reconcile our inner and physical worlds? At times it is useful to reflect on why we are on this spiritual journey. What is our motivation? We do have motivation or we would not be following this path. And how are we going in our physical lives? Is there any correlation between the two? Does the way we live our physical lives match our inner world? I want to say up front that I am not talking about evangelizing. I am asking if the ideals of our spiritual world can become manifest in the physical world. The physical world we live in is not a very nice place overall, although our little piece of it might be pleasant. We live in a world of greed, poverty war and many other things that you can name for yourselves. The question is can we follow a spiritual journey and ignore the world around us? We cannot. The world around us impacts on us at all levels. We cannot keep a bright shiny soul and live in the sewer. I am writing this on New Year's Eve, 31st of December 2008. This year has been a year of death, destruction, oppression and genocide. Tibet, the Sudan, Iraq, Iran, Palestine. The list is endless. What about the subprime crisis plunging the world into financial chaos? None of these things needed to happen. They happened because so many of the human race have no connection with their inner being. They happened, and continue to happen because the human race as an entity has not awakened to their spiritual being. It is sad that religion has been the excuse for many of the atrocities of the last year and yet there is not one ounce of spirituality in any of these acts. There needs to be reconciliation between our internal and external lives. If things are to change our souls need to be heard. There is no need to riot or fight to bring about change. There is no need to do much at all except say no. That is all that is required. No is the most powerful word in any language. If the soul says no and we say no no in the external world and no force can oppose it. I am expecting, or hoping that there will be a critical mass where enough people say no to bring about a spontaneous awakening of the human race. It is a numbers thing. 
When more people want peace instead of war and say so peace will happen. When more people want an end to poverty than there are those that profit from it we can all live instead of just existing. The spiritual journey has two parts. There is the inner spiritual journey that is ours and ours alone. A journey that is different for everyone. Then there is the spiritual journey that is the spiritual journey of the whole human race. We are all part of that journey. I hope that we can reconcile the two and make it one journey. 2009 is only another date, but it can be given symbolic value if this is the year that human race awakes to its inner soul. Right and Wrong The concept of right and wrong is a concept that really fouls up the human race. It operates at three levels. The religious level. The legal level. The personal level. We can do anything we like to anyone at any time and remain free of sin because whatever we are doing is God's will. Terrorism is often an extreme example of this concept. Declare jihad and kill the infidel. In the mind of the perpetrators they are free of sin. The Spanish Inquisition operated on the same principle. The persecution of witches and many other atrocities have occurred by invoking the same format. It goes back to the beginning of time. Whether or not the perpetrators of these acts are doing God's will is problematic. There is a section from Matthew that goes along the lines of you call my name but I do not know you. You say, but Lord, everything I have done I have done in your name. But still I do not know you, for as you do to the least of my creatures, you do unto me. Just because we do something in the name of God does not make it God's will. At the next level down, the legal, goes along the line of we can do anything we want to anyone at any time, and provided it is legal, we remain free of sin. Our courts do not operate on justice, or any altruistic concepts. They operate on legality. Stealing from shareholders is okay as long as it is legal. Stitching someone up with an ambiguously worded contract is okay as long as it is done legally. We will see a lot of the legality concept in the next year. When the dust settles on the subprime debacle, and the world recession, the focus will turn to accountability. There will be a lot of it wasn't my fault, it was legal. It will be interesting to see how successful the architects of the subprime market at claiming the legal high ground. Even if the subprime market was legal it was still a stupid idea, and the authors of the stupidity are still responsible. The bottom level is right and wrong. We can do anything we like to anyone at any time and provided we are right and they are wrong we remain free of sin. This works before and after the event. Right and wrong before the event is a cynical exercise in creating the other as the wrongdoer before acting. If we want to invade a sovereign country we might invent evidence of that country having weapons of mass destruction. If we do this well we might even convince ourselves that these weapons of mass destruction actually exist. It is interesting that before the invasion of Iraq Bush, Blair and Howard spent three weeks proving it was legal. Thus they remain doubly free of sin. Right and wrong, after the event, is finding a reason why we did something that was in hindsight, a mistake. Do we say I made a mistake? No. We find a reason we were right. There is a traffic accident. The driver of the car that hit the other says it was not my fault. I swerved to avoid the hammer that cut across in front of me. This may be true. But very often it is the excuse for driving poorly and no hammer existed, or if it did it did not cut across. But given a short space of time the hammer will exist, and will have cut across, if only in the head of the driver who caused the accident. That driver will of course, remain free of sin. You lie to your lover. It takes no time at all to find a reason why you were right and it was their fault. Maybe you can find a reason why they deserved it. This is the concept of right and wrong. It is a means by which we can avoid personal responsibility by finding a reason why it is always the fault of someone else. Give a little practice it is possible to do anything you want to any at any time and place, and remain free of sin under all circumstances. Other than that the concept right and wrong has no practical meaning.
an alternative interpretation of the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is, from beginning to end, a statement of free will and personal responsibility. If the teachings of Jesus had been accepted by the people, the Pharisees would have been left powerless. It is strange that the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6 and 7, is the one place in the Bible where the teachings of Jesus are spelled out and yet Matthew is not part of the epistolistic teachings of the Christian Church. Look closely at the modern religious institution and you will discover that it has one outstanding characteristic, it is, with a few notable exceptions around the world, engaged in a headlong flight from reality. Most of us were brought up on preaching churches, where the pulpit becomes a protective barrier keeping the minister at a comfortable arm's length from the sordid problems he so eloquently describes. Knopf's, 1984. It's the same problem that existed with the Pharisees. Make laws, preach, tell people what they should do, and all problems will be solved without the need to get involved with the problems. The law of the Pharisees was built on the premise thou shalt not, with the list of thou shalt nots being exceedingly long, complicated, and leaving the Pharisees the sole arbitrators of if thou had or had not. The Pharisees set themselves up as God's representatives on earth and gave themselves the responsibility of deciding law and punishment on God's behalf. Unfortunately, the Church of Paul has followed the same path. At the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus taught the still radical concept of self-responsibility. It was up to each of us to seek God on a one-to-one -one basis. This completely undermined the power of the Pharisees, who sought to control all things. The message Jesus gave that day was a profile of a person who lived according to God's wishes, and it is a profile of Jesus himself. At the same time, Jesus made it clear that it was our choice we had free will to accept his teachings or not. It was the character of Jesus that he followed his own teachings to the letter. The Sermon on the Mount begins in Matthew 5. 3 Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. 4 Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. 5 Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. 6 Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Greek, for they shall be satisfied. 7 Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. 8 Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Greek, clean in heart. 9 Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Greek, shall be called the sons of God. The Sermon on the Mount starts with a list of blessed are. For they statements. I see this as saying that if you want it you can have it. This sets the scene for the way I see the Sermon on the Mount. It starts with Jesus saying if you want it you can have it, and then follows with details of how to get it. The word righteousness is used over and over again in the Sermon on the Mount. It is used to describe two types of righteousness the righteousness of the Pharisees and the righteousness of God. Jesus does not seem to like the righteousness of the Pharisees one little bit. There are three religions that trace their origins back to Abraham. These are Judaism, Christianity and Islam. The secret of these three religions are that they are not religions at all, they are legal systems. The Abrahamic legal system is that the priests are God's lawyers on earth. Therefore they can do anything they like to anyone at any time and remain free of sin because since they are God's lawyers, whatever they do must be God's will. This passes down to our secular legal system as we can do whatever we like to anyone at any time, and provided it is legal, we remain free of sin. The next step down is right and wrong. We can do whatever we like to anyone at any time, and provided we are right and they are wrong we remain free of sin. That is all being right is, a way of remaining free of sin. The righteousness of the Pharisees is the righteousness of Abram they were God's lawyers on earth and they could do whatever they liked and remain free of sin. But Jesus said that we must go past this righteousness if we are to find the kingdom of heaven. The section for great is your reward in heaven is a difficult one because of the way Jesus uses heaven. 
instead of referring to the conventional Christian concept of heaven being in the sky. He gives a different perspective of the kingdom of heaven in the following passage from Luke 17, 20 And when he was demanded of the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not by observation. 21 Neither shall they say, Lo here! Or lo there! For, behold, the kingdom of God is within you. There is a continuous switch from the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven in the New Testament. Whether or not there is a distinction here that is not apparent I do not know. To me it seems that the two terms are so close that they are interchangeable. My understanding of this passage is that rewards come from within. If we want peace, mercy and all the other things, then we must go past Abrahamic religion, past right and wrong, and find peace and mercy from within. My understanding of this part of the Sermon on the Mount comes partly from what comes later in the sermon. This opening section seems to be a general overview of what is to follow. 13 Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost its flavor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out, and to be trodden under foot of man. Greek, but if the salt be tainted, by what shall it be salted? for nothing is it strong longer except being cast out. 14 Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. 15 Neither do men light a candle, and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and giveth light to all that are in the house. 16 Let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works, and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. If you want these things then you must stand up and be counted. If you don't, then you are of no use. If you don't want to be counted, then don't complain when you are trodden under foot of man. If you do stand up to be counted, then what is within will shine forth. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. If you do stand up to be counted, don't expect it to be easy you will be standing up to the Abrahamic system and you can expect full weight of the righteousness of the Pharisees. But you will find peace from within. 17 Think not that I am come to destroy the law, or the prophets, I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. 18 For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, not one jot or one title shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Greek Iota one nor one point by no means shall pass away from the law. 19 Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments, and shall teach men so, he will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven, but whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. 20 For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Here Jesus is making it clear that he is not saying break the ten commandments, the law of Moses, he is saying keep them. The problem is the righteousness of the Pharisees. The ten commandments say don't kill, don't cheat, don't want what isn't yours and other basic rules to help people get along in this world. But the Abrahamic law is a way of finding excuses for our transgressions so we remain free of sin. I am right, you are wrong. Therefore it is your fault if I harm you. 21 Ye have heard it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of judgment. 22 But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment and whosoever shall say to his brother, Ricca, shall be in danger of the council, but whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. The words without a cause are not in the Greek text. The Christian church has inserted an escape clause into the words of Jesus. That allows the church to be angry provided it has a cause. What is a cause is entirely the judgment of the church. This is Abrahamic law in action. The Crusades, the burning of witches, the Inquisition and all the other atrocities carried out in the name of the Christian Church have only been possible because of the concept that there can be a cause. 
and the church remains free of sin because they are God's lawyers on earth and so everything they do must be God's will. According to the book of Matthew, there is never a cause, these words simply do not appear in the original text. This is another example of the mistranslation that changes the meaning of a passage, and takes power away from the individual and gives it to the church. We can say things that make us accountable by law, but if we call someone a fool, we are in danger of hellfire. When we call someone a fool, we are making the judgment that we are superior to that person. The problems associated with judgment come later in the sermon. This passage is also a lead into the responsibility of dealing with our own problems before attempting to solve the problems of others. Again, personal responsibility is paramount. 23 Therefore if thou bring a gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath thought against thee, Greek, something against thee, 24 Leave the gift before the altar, and go thy way, first to be reconciled with thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. This is a lesson that seems to be completely forgotten by the modern world. If we want to offer something to God, we must first fix our own lives, because fixing our own lives is the greatest gift we can give to God. This makes total nonsense of any war or conflict between religious groups. When Christians fight against Jews, Muslims, Hindus or any other group, or among themselves in the name of God, they directly contradict the teachings of Jesus. According to Jesus, God is not interested in any gifts from us until we learn to live in peace with one another, and that is the greatest gift we can offer God. It is our responsibility to fix any conflict we have with another. Then, and only then, can we know God. 25 Agree with thine adversary quickly, while thou art in the way with him, Greek be well disposed to the opponent of thee quickly, while thou art with him in the way, lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou be cast into prison. 26 Truly I say unto thee, thou shalt by no means come out thence, till thou hast paid the uttermost farthing. This is a passage that amplifies the practical side of not getting into disputes. If you want to get involved with legal disputes, it is going to cost. This is still valid advice for living in today's world, stay out of the hands of the lawyers, you may seek justice, but all you will get is the law. This passage highlights the difference between what Jesus taught and what the Christian church teaches. Jesus taught a very practical, day-to-day -day way of living. This passage goes beyond the law. If we have a problem with another person, fix it. Do not fix it by anger and judgment, but by agreement. If the lawyers get involved, the only ones to benefit will be the lawyers. There is something more here. The lawyers work with Abrahamic law. To find peace and mercy from within we need to go past this. 27 Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shall not commit adultery. 28 But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Throughout the reported teachings of Jesus there is continuous use of stories and examples to illustrate a point. Jesus could have used any of the Ten Commandments to illustrate his point. He could have said that whosoever wants to kill someone has already committed murder in his heart. The point of this example is that it is not enough not to do something because the law or commandments tell you not to. To find real peace, there must be no desire to think of breaking the commandments. 29 And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out, and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. Greek, the right eye of thee causes thee to stumble. 30 And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off, and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. Greek, the right hand of thee causes thee to stumble. If there is something about ourselves that causes us to act in a way that is different from the way we want to act, get rid of it. Have we learned a habit that is harmful to us? Have we learned to act in ways that offend others? Unlearn it. Get rid of it.
30 It hath been said, Whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. Greek, dismisses the wife of him. 31 But I say unto you, that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery, and whosoever marry her that is divorced committeth adultery. Greek, who are dismissed, woman, marries committeth adultery. A different version is given in Matthew 19, original Greek, 3 and approached to him Pharisees tempting him and saying, Is it lawful to dismiss the wife of him for every cause? 4 And he answering said, Not did you read thee, 1, creating from, the beginning male and female made them? 5 And he said, For the sake of this shall leave a man there, his, father and thee, his, mother and shall cleave to the wife of him, and shall be the two in flesh one. 6 So as no longer are they two but flesh one. What therefore God yoked together, a man let not separate. 7 They say to him, Why then Moses did enjoin to give a document of divorce and to dismiss? 8 He says to them, Moses in view of the obduracy of you allowed you to dismiss the wives of you, but from, the beginning not it has been so. 9 But I say to you that whoever dismisses the wife of him not of, for, fornication and marries another, commits adultery. 10 Say to him the disciples, If so is the cause of a man with the wife, it is not expedient to marry. 11 And he said to them, Not all men grasp saying this, but, those, to whom it is given. 12 For there are eunuchs who from, the womb of a mother were born so, and there are eunuchs who were made eunuchs by men, and there are eunuchs who made themselves on account of the kingdom of the heavens. The one, being able to grasp, it, let him grasp. Matthew 19, Translated Marshall this is a difficult section. What makes it so difficult is that the rules and attitudes toward divorce during the time and place Jesus lived is not known in detail, and the customs varied greatly from place to place. Also Marshall is a direct translation with no attempt at interpretation. There is a contradiction in the two quotes. 31 But I say unto you, that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery, and nine but I say to you that whoever dismisses the wife of him not of, for, fornication and marries another, commits adultery. In the first it is the woman who is caused to commit adultery, but in the second it is the man who commits adultery. My understanding is that this is another of the examples that Jesus uses to illustrate a larger concept. There are all sorts of concepts mixed up in this one. What Jesus meant here is not clear, probably because of translation and context, but here are some of the possibilities. First, there is the concept of equality. Men and women were once joined together as one flesh, but now a man could just divorce his wife at will. Equality had been lost. The idea that a man could have a responsibility to his wife as well as his wife having responsibilities to him would have been radical. Men and women equal in the Jewish religion of the day? That really is wild. Next comes the concept that if a man divorces a woman to remarry, he is guilty of adultery. We have responsibilities to each other. No matter what the law says, we cannot use people and discard them when it suits us. This is the larger issue here. We have responsibilities to each other. If we make a commitment, then we have the responsibility to keep that commitment. I think the except for fornication part is an illustration that we are released from our commitments if the other person breaks their commitments first. If the woman is put away and then finds someone else, her husband is the one who bears the responsibility of her adultery. Again, if we go past the marriage bit, the concept seems to be that if someone does something that is a consequence of our actions, then we are responsible. This is a statement of the responsibilities we have to each other. Although it does not come from the Sermon on the Mount, the version from Matthew 19 does add to the general concept. 12 For there are eunuchs who from, the womb of a mother were born so, and there are eunuchs who were made eunuchs by men, and there are eunuchs who made themselves on account of the kingdom of the heavens. The one, being able to grasp, it, 
let him grasp. There are things we can do, there are things we cannot do, and there are things it would be better we did not do. I think that this or something like it is the point of the Unix example. This ties back to the responsibilities we have to each other. In this example we may want to put aside our wife to have another, but if we do, we commit adultery and cause our wife to commit adultery. This applies equally the other way around, but it is written here from the male side because this is the form of the quote. The part the, one, being able to grasp, it, let him grasp is something that Jesus uses in different forms, let those who have ears to hear, hear. It indicates that he is talking about something that has much wider ramifications than the example he is using. 33 again. Ye have heard that it hath been said by them of old time, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths, Greek, again ye heard that it was said to the ancients, Thou shalt not perjure, but to the Lord shalt repay the oaths of thee. 34 But I say unto you, Swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, 35 Nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem for it is the city of the great king. 36 Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black. Do not make promises to external forces, beings or things. External promises mean nothing. We have no ability whatsoever to evoke any outside authority to witness our ability to fulfill a promise that is entirely our responsibility. The only way we can give authority to our promises is to do so. Even marriage vows have no meaning as promises, the vows can only be given credence by action. There is no point in promising to be loving and caring to another, or making any other promises. The only promise that matters is made by the action of doing by our own free will. That is the only domain we have. Don't promise to do things, simply do them. Up until now. The Sermon on the Mount has been setting general parameters for the core teaching of Jesus. Now comes that core issue. The core teaching of Jesus is contained in the next three verses, 37 But let your communication be, yea, yea, nay, nay, for whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. Greek, for the excess of these evil is. 38 Ye have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth, 39 But I say unto you, that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. Greek, but I tell you not to oppose evil. All we can do in any situation is to say yes or no. That is all. If we want something, we can say yes. If we don't, we can say no. If something is acceptable to us we can say yes to it, if something is not acceptable to us we can say no. That is all. Why is this? Basically, if someone wants us to do something and we do not want to do it, we can say no. There is nothing more to say, but if they come back and say why not and we respond, we are justifying why we don't want something, and we are then told all the reasons why we should want something we will end up the bad guy for not wanting to do something someone else tells us we should want to do. There is only one person who knows what we want and do not want and that is us. Going back to responsibility. We have our responsibilities which we take on freely. We have to decide for ourselves what responsibilities we want. Our choice. Unless we can learn to say yes and no to what we want and don't want we will end up with responsibilities we don't want and only have because someone else tells us we are supposed to want them. If we accept responsibilities we decide we want from our own free will. If we accept responsibilities we do not want, they become a huge burden. And if we then try to escape from these responsibilities that were forced upon us, we are the bad guy. Central to all of Jesus' teachings is deciding what we want, and after choosing what we want, accepting responsibility for our choices. So what happens next? We say no and we get all the reasons why we are supposed to say yes and we still say no. It is our free will to say no to something we do not want. 
we will now probably be bombarded with judgment of our actions and we are this terrible person for saying no. What can we do about it? Nothing. We get dumped on for not doing as we are told, and there is nothing that can be done to avoid it. If we try to fight back, it just gets worse. Turn the other cheek has been distorted into something it is not. It is not a nice spiritual concept to be practiced with our faces in the dirt saying I am but a poor sinner. Turning the other cheek is a practical way of avoiding being pushed into doing something you do not want to do. You say no, you get dumped on. This is the best it gets. Anything you do in retaliation will only make it worse. There is more to it than that. If you just say no, there is nothing anyone can do about it. They may rant and rave but they can do nothing. But if you rant and rave back, you will lose and end up doing things you do not want to do. Just say no, turn the other cheek, walk away and you are fireproof. We cannot fight evil, but we can sound no to it. It works the other way around too. If we try to force someone into something they do not want and they say no, and nothing else, there is nothing we can do about it. 40 And if any man will sue thee of the law, and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. 41 And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. 40 To give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee turn not thou away. 43 Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor, and hate thine enemy. 44 But I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you, and persecute you, the Greek version is much shorter, but I tell you, love ye the enemies of you and pray ye for the one persecuting you, 45 That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven for maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. Greek, become sons of the Father. 46 For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? Greek, the tax collectors the same do? 47 And if ye salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so? Greek, even the Gentiles the same do? 48 Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. The translators have added do good to them that hate you, and swapped publicans for tax collectors and Gentiles. Of these changes, the first is the most serious in terms of understanding the teachings of Jesus. We are not told to do good to them that hate us. We have already been told how to treat our enemies simply say no. We have no power over who the sun rises on, or who gets wet when it rains. But the adding in of do good to them that hate us destroys the meaning. Loving and blessing our enemies takes away our mindset of judging right and wrong. It is for our benefit. Jesus did not tell us to do good to them that hate us. Jesus told us to just say no. Love thine enemy includes everyone. Jews, Muslims and all denominations of Christians. Since he did not make any exclusions, Jesus must have included the Romans. That would really have upset the Pharisees. 48 Be therefore ye perfect as the Father of you heavenly perfect. Greek version. What has gone before has been instructions on how to be as perfect as your heavenly perfect Father. Do what you can to get along with everyone, but remember the instruction about yes and no. Doing our best to get along with everyone does not mean becoming a doormat. But according to Jesus the kingdom of God, or the kingdom of heaven comes from within. I think this line also means something along the lines that if you do what has been taught to you are within will be visible. Matthew 6. Take heed that ye do not your arms before men, to be seen of them, otherwise ye have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Greek the righteousness of you not to do in front of men with a view to be seen by them. To therefore when thou dost thine arms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward.
3 But when thou doest arms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doth, for that thine arms may be in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. Greek, will repay thee. The original does not say reward thee openly, only that you will be repaid. The Greek version starts, and take ye heed the righteousness of you not to do in front of men with a view to be seen by them. Arms are not mentioned till later. Giving arms to impress others does not make us good or righteous. What matters is what we do when there is nobody to see us. 5 And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the street, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. 6 But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, Greek, private room, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy father which is in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Again, the original does not say openly. 7 But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions, as the Hindu, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Greek, Gentiles, not heathens. 8 Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your father knoweth what things ye have need of, before ye ask him. As with arms, it is not what you do for an audience that matters, it is what you do when there is no one to see you that makes the person. 9 After this manner therefore pray ye, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 10 Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth, as it is in heaven. 11 Give us this day our daily bread. 12 And forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. 13 And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever. Amen. It is worth looking at the original Greek version of the Lord's Prayer in full, 9 Thus therefore pray ye, Father of us the one in the heavens, let it be hallowed the name of thee 10 Let it come the kingdom of thee, let it come the will of thee, as in heaven also on earth, 11 The daily bread of us give to us today. 12 And forgive us the debts of us, as indeed we forgave the debtors of us, 13 And not bring us into temptation, but rescue us from evil. The most obvious change is that for thine is the kingdom has been added to the authorized version, but there are subtle changes that are far more significant. We are told this is to be a private prayer pray to thy father which is in secret, and let it come, the kingdom of thee, let it come. The will of thee is a much more intimate form of speech than the command thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. The Lord's Prayer in its Greek form shows the private, one-on-one -on -one nature of our relationship with God. Why the continued reference to secrecy? Could it be that the kingdom comes from within, and that cannot be seen except by ourselves? Father of us the one in the heavens, let it be hallowed the name of thee. Let it come the kingdom of thee. Let it come the will of thee, as in heaven also on earth. When viewed as part of the overall teachings of Jesus I see the Lord's prayer as a prayer that we bring forth what is within. Let the intent of the person within become manifest in the physical world. Let us all live in free will. Let us create heaven here on earth. The daily bread of us give to us today, and forgive us the debts of us, as indeed we forgave the debtors of us and not bring us into temptation, but rescue us from evil. This tells us how to do it. Give us our daily bread, live in the moment. If we forgive others we forgive ourselves, and we have released judgment. Now that we are living in the moment and clear of judgment, we don't want to be tempted to fall back into the old ways. This version of the Lord's Prayer is totally consistent with the three verses that tell us to say yes to what we want and no to what we don't want, and not to resist evil. The difference between the official version and this version is that the first place is the responsibility for the fulfillment of the Lord's Prayer on some entity out there and the second place is the responsibility on the self. 14 For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. 15 But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Forgiveness and grace are given on a one-to-one -one basis. 
No one can claim that I am forgiven because I am a Christian. Forgiveness and grace are a product of how we live our lives. Jesus always comes back to personal responsibility in one form or another. If we accept that Father, Parent, is the entity within, then it becomes that if we are to forgive ourselves we need to forgive others. 16 Moreover when ye fast, be not, as the hypocrites, of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. 17 But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thine head, and wash thy face. 18 That thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father, which seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. Repeatedly in the authorized version of the Bible shall reward thee openly has been substituted for will repay thee. There is no promise that our repayment will be public, or even material. Again the message, don't make a big deal of being religious. Spirituality means nothing if it is only for show. Live the life, but there is no need to make a big deal out of it. The rewards may not be visible or material, but they are real. The real reward is free will. 19 Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. 20 But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. 21 For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. This passage is Gnostic in nature. Your treasures are in heaven. And if you find these treasures, your heart will also be in heaven. The passage is also cryptic, whether by design or by ill translation. The passage could also read that your treasure, and heaven, is in your heart. Fortunately the two interpretations are close enough to each other for the general idea to be contained in both. 20 To the light of the body is in the eye, if therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. Greek, the lamp of the body. 23 But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is the darkness! 24 No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one, and love the other, or else he will hold to the one, and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. We cannot serve two masters. Who are these two masters? This is where Jesus challenges his listeners. Are you going to live by Abrahamic law, that everything is okay as long as it is legal, or are you going to live by what you know within yourself is right? We cannot live our lives according to what is within when it suits us and what is legal when that suits us. We need to be single-minded about saying no to the unacceptable, and yes to what is acceptable if we are to realize the person within. A single eye. No exceptions. Then the whole body will shine with light. What is within becomes visible. But if we work with what is legal, and use being right to legalize our unacceptable actions, the whole body is in darkness. The person who is within cannot be seen. 25 Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment? 26 Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than thee? 27 Which of you by taking thought can add one cubit unto his stature? Greek, but who of you being anxious can add to the structure of him cubit one? 28 And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin, Greek and concerning clothing why be ye anxious? 29 And yet I say unto you, that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. 30 Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Greek, little faiths. 31 Therefore take no thought saying, What shall we eat? or, what shall we drink? 
or, wherewithal shall we be clothed? 32, For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. Greek, For these things the nations seek after, for the heavenly Father of you that ye need these things of all. 33 But seek ye first the kingdom of God, and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. 34 Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Greek, therefore be ye not anxious for the morrow, for the morrow will be anxious of itself, sufficient to the day the evil of it. Reinforcement the first thing to ensure is that we work on the person within being visible. If we work on what is acceptable rather than what is legal, all the things we need will be added. This section is not an invitation to be irresponsible. It is not an invitation to do whatever you like and expect everything to turn out the way you want it to. It is an invitation to take care of the things that are important. The essential part of this section is in the last two verses. 33 But seek ye first the kingdom of God, and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. 34 Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Greek, therefore be ye not anxious for the morrow, for the morrow will be anxious of itself, sufficient to the day the evil of it. First of all seek what is within. We have been told how? Just use those two little words yes and no. Harder than it sounds. How do we say no when doing so might jeopardize the things we want? But we cannot serve two masters. We do it or we don't. If we do hold fast to the truth that comes from within, all things will be added, even if we do not know how at the time. Don't worry about tomorrow we have sufficient to worry about in the evil that exists today. There is another thing about people who need to be right to legalize their actions. Their righteousness will include telling us what we need to do. If we do not accept their righteousness, there will be all sorts of dire results. Don't worry about it. We have sufficient to do today saying no to the evil that exists today without worrying about the new evils of tomorrow saying yes or no to the things that present themselves today is enough. This can be difficult because it is often fear of what might happen tomorrow if we say no that pressures us into saying yes to something we do not really want. Matthew 7. 1 Judge not, that ye be not judged. 2 For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged, and with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. 3 And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? For or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and, behold, a beam is in thine eye? 5 Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. To me there are no hidden meanings in this passage. It does not need any translation or interpretation. The Sermon on the Mount is not a religious document. It is a practical guide to how to live if we want to create heaven in our hearts. It is an accurate and detailed guide that loses its meaning if turned into religion. Jesus, as a secular person in the context of his practical teachings, is a far more powerful figure than religious judgment makes him. The punishment that we have received for judging Jesus in a religious context is that the real truth and power of his teachings have been lost to us. When we judge we are punished by our own loss. 6 Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet, and turn again and rend you. Don't be an evangelist. If you follow what Jesus is teaching, then you are working on yourself not others. So there are those who do not understand. So be it. Throughout the Sermon on the Mount there is the emphasis on how to live, how to say yes to what we want and no to what we don't. To live according to what we know rather than what is legal. The righteousness of heaven, that comes from within, is the real righteousness, and the Abrahamic righteousness of the Pharisees is no righteousness at all. 
7 Ask, and it shall be given you, Seek, and ye shall find, Knock, and it shall be opened unto you, 8 For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. 9 Or what man is there of you, whom if his son ask bread, will he give him a stone? 10 Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? 11 If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? 12 Therefore all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Do you want to know the truth from within about who you are, what you want, and what is really important to you in this life? Ask. The answers are there if you ask. I cannot give you the answer. Jesus never gave the answer. What Jesus did was tell us where to find the answer. The answer is within. You know who you are, what you want and what is important to you. The way to find that answer as given by Jesus is to suspend judgment of yourself and others and ask. The answer will be given from within. Then you can say yes to what you want and no to what you don't want. Then you will live the life you want to live rather than a life according to the judgments of others. 13 Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way, that leadeth to destruction, and many that be which go in thereat, Greek, enter in through the narrow gate, because wide the gate and broad the way leading away to destruction, and many are the ones going through it. 14 Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life, and few the be that find it. To live life without judgment and according to who we are from within is a very narrow path. The path that Jesus describes in the Sermon on the Mount is a narrow path. But what is the wide path that leads to destruction? If we do not follow that narrow path that comes from within we are destroyed. Who we are comes from within. If we try to live according to the judgments of who we are supposed to be, the person we are cannot become manifest in the physical, and we are destroyed? The body may walk the earth for another fifty years, but there will be nobody home. The person we are has been destroyed? The pressures to follow the rules and judgments that surround us are enormous. It is easy just to give in and lose ourselves. But the narrow path leads to life. Life for the person we are if we have the strength to follow that path. 15 Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. 16 Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns, or figs of thistles? 17 Even so every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. 18 A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. 19 Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down, and cast into the fire. 20 Wherefore by their fruits ye shall know them. The difficulty is that we are not to judge, but how can we tell the false prophets from those speaking truth without making a judgment? Here the answer is given that we can see the results of someone's work, and decide if they are the results we want in our lives. If they are, we can say yes, if not, then we can say no without passing judgment on the person, for the excess of these evil is. The false prophets sell the image of the spiritual journey. This cannot be the true path because the true path to heaven according to Jesus comes from within. We all have teachers in our quest to find out who we are. Sometimes we learn in the positive, often we learn from the negative. We are often taught what we don't want as a way of finding what we do want. The main thing is that we find what we want rather than what we are supposed to want. A true prophet will encourage you to find what you already have within. A false prophet will offer you a set path that is guaranteed to go where you think you are supposed to want to be. And don't be surprised if the ticket costs a fortune. Nobody can tell you your path. Jesus never tried to do that. Your path is yours alone because you are a unique person. Nobody like you has ever existed before, and will never exist again. The best that anyone can do, including Jesus, 
is to show you how to clear away the rubbish so that you can see your own path. That, to me, is the strength of Jesus. The clearing away of the garbage so we can find our own path. 21 Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doth the will of my Father which is in heaven. 22 Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works? 23 And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. This passage also continues the theme of false prophets. Many may call the name of God all their lives. Call themselves religious, follow dogma to the minutest detail, but unless they back their words with action, God does not know them. The action required is to know self. No matter what we do, unless we come to know self we can never know God. The paradox is that it is not God that does not know us, we do not know ourselves. 24 Therefore whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, and doth them, I will liken him unto a wise man, which built his house upon a rock. 25 And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not for it was founded upon a rock. 26 And every one that heareth these sayings of mine, and doth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man, which built his house upon the sand. 27 And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. The rock to build life on is the rock of knowing self. If you know yourself you can survive anything. If your life is built on being who you are supposed to be, you will be destroyed when judgment of who you are supposed to be falls apart. And it will. All judgment falls apart when it is exposed to reality. 28 And it came to pass, when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine. 29 For he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. The Greek version is, and when it came to pass finished Jesus words these, were astounded the crowds at the teaching of him, 29 for he was teaching them as authority having, and not as the scribes of them. Christianity uses the authority of Jesus as the excuse for existence. But Jesus never claimed authority. Remove the word one from the last verse and the meaning totally changes. Jesus taught that the people had authority. He did not claim authority for himself the way the scribes claimed authority for themselves. One little word inserted into the Sermon on the Mount destroys the meaning of the teachings of Jesus. Jesus taught personal responsibility, finding ourselves and living life as we want to live it instead of as we are told to live it. Throughout the Bible there are slips in translation that change the meaning of the text. The Sermon on the Mount is Jesus laying out exactly what his teachings were all about, in modern terms it was his mission statement. A mission statement that does not match the teachings of the Christian Church. Jesus taught the need for personal responsibility in all things. Jesus taught free will. The Christian Church has changed this mission statement into a hierarchy of blind obedience with the congregation having no responsibility for their lives. In this there is no difference between what the Pharisees taught and the teachings of Orthodox Christianity. The slips in translation between the original Greek version of Matthew and the authorized version are not uniform. Throughout the text where there are no contentious issues, the authorized version stays very close to the meaning of the Greek version, but in the areas of teachings, such as the Sermon on the Mount, the errors are many and blatant. What is stasis? Stasis is a concept that is used continuously by who's following a spiritual path, or those working self-help programs, but it is seldom called stasis. It is an important concept and understanding stasis will help people understand why they are working a particular way. Stasis has several meaning but in this context is an internal that is held constant by a force around its boundary. Suppose you have a population of people and they are held constant by a political entity. 
At first the stasis is easy to maintain because the difference inside the stasis is not very different to outside the stasis. But as the world changes the pressure for change within the stasis increase and more control has to be used to hold the stasis constant. At some point the control fails and the stasis explodes. In the physical world revolution, uprising and civil wars are the result of the controls needed to hold the stasis constant failing. Communism failed when the internal need for change becomes stronger than the force keeping it contained. For the individual the concept of stasis is equally relevant. Someone works at a job they hate. At first it isn't too bad, but the pressure builds until there is an explosion. Married couples do nothing to solve the problems building in their marriage until it all blows up and the marriage is over. To be successful on our spiritual path it is essential to keep the boundary between our inner life and our external life free of control. If we don't pressure will build and when control fails there will be an explosion. If something goes wrong in our physical world it has gone wrong. And if getting upset or angry is an appropriate response then get angry. If we attempt to pass it off with some spiritual platitude or saying, everything happens for the best, it will place pressure on our spiritual being to conform to an ideal that is not realistic. If we make a mistake then accept we have made a mistake. Learn from it, try to avoid doing it again and move on. The alternative is to give ourselves a hard time because we are on a spiritual path and we are supposed to know. Each time we give ourselves a hard time the pressure will build. Then there will be an explosion and we will abandon the spiritual way because we are not good enough. Nobody on this earth is perfect. The spiritual path is not about perfection, it is learning to do the best we can. The way to deal with the pressures of the physical world so that it does not put pressure on our spiritual being is to learn, accept and move on. Everything on the spiritual path is the same concept repeated in many different forms. Learn, accept and move on. This is how to deal with stasis in all its forms. The worst thing we can do is to try to force ourselves to conform to an idealized perfection that cannot be achieved. Science and Metaphysics Asking the Right Question The apparent conflict between science and metaphysics is not a conflict at all. The problem is that we are asking the wrong questions. Science asks how and metaphysics asks why. This highlights a problem the human race has with the questions of how and why. We are often confused and ask how when we should ask why and why when we should be asking how? If we could understand the mechanics of how everything in the universe worked we would know everything about how but nothing about why. Scientists might claim that they now know how everything worked so God, spirituality was no longer necessary. But why things are the way they are has not been addressed. Why does a car engine work and drive the car along the road? There is expansion of gases that drives pistons that make things go around and so on. But look at the question. The question that has been answered is how not why. If the question is why then we do not know. Why does the gas expand? Because that is what gases do when they get hot. Why do gases expand when they get hot? It is because the atoms in a gas vibrate at a higher rate at higher temperatures and so on until the only answer is that is the way things are and why is just a big mystery. We can describe how things are but when we ask why ultimately we know nothing. I have just watched a program on television called everything we know could be wrong. It was about the need for the completely unknown dark matter and dark energy to exist if the universe exists. This program covered the points that I have covered in my book Alternative Relativity. It covered the expanding universe, dark matter and dark energy in the scientific contemporary truth that a very large portion of the universe must be there but completely outside our perception if the universe is to exist at all. But the conclusions are different to the conclusions reached in my book. The TV program ended with scientists physically trying to measure something that does not exist but must exist if we are to exist. They were looking for the how question. Science had made the judgment that there has to be a single uniform dark matter and a single and uniform dark force. This is an unsupportable position. 
it's something is outside our comprehension we cannot make judgments about the form. This could be a very full universe teeming with life forms that are not comprehensible to out limited faculties. Imagine a frog in a pond. The frog has eyesight that is perfect for catching insects, but it is unlikely that the frog can see the world around it in any comprehensible form. We could turn the problem around and say the problem is not that there is some mysterious exotic force that holds the universe together but that our ability to perceive reality is limited to somewhat less than 10% of existence. But that may not mean that the rest on the universal cannot see us. We could be fully visible and accessible. This could also give a whole new slant to our concepts of spirituality. As I state throughout my writing I think and write in terms of ideas. I make no claims that my comments what form the unseen universe takes is no more than speculation. But what I am saying is that scientific study the missing universe has become tunnel vision. There is no evidence or imperative that the missing universe has to be a single matis slash force entity. Any search for what is missing should include the metaphysical as well as the scientific and the two need to work in cooperation remembering that they are asking separate questions about the same problem. The Triangle and the Atheist Terror It is commonly believed that the opposite of positive is negative. This is not true. The opposite of positive is not positive. And the opposite of negative is not negative. This makes nonsense of positive thinking. To see only the positive leaves us open to abuse because we do not see the negative coming until it is too late. Similarly if we see only the negative we miss out on all the good things that come our way. There is another position. There is the neutral position which is basically at rest. It is not positive and not negative. It is the position of having choices. This is a triangular format rather than a straight line. Straight line thinking leads to polarization. If we think only positive thoughts, or think only negatively choices do not exist. Our position on any issue is decided before we even know what the issue is. To be only anything is a prejudice that blinds us to choices. Often we are told to step back from a problem to see the problem as it is. Stepping back from straight line thinking forms a triangle and that is where answers are found. From the neutral position we can see the issues without judgment and decide if we want to act positively or act negatively, or if we want to act. Maybe it just doesn't matter to us. The last position is a position that gives us major problems. Many seem to think that they must have a position on everything. How the triangular nature of choice and straight line thinking translate to the question. Whether or not God exists can be confusing. In straight line atheist thinking the two opposing pole become about the relevance of religion. The basic atheist argument becomes that religion is rubbish and therefore God is rubbish. The religious argument become that since followers believe in a religious system then the God their system has invented God must exist. The argument is about religion, not about God. And there is the added problem that this straight line religious thinking is that the word God is seen only in the context of religion. Anti-religious becomes anti-God. The third position, the position I take, is that there is no correlation between God and religion. My position is also that because there is no correlation between religion and God then we cannot know God, if God exists, in terms of religion. This is the third, the neutral position on the triangle. From the position neutrality the futility of the religion slash atheist argument can be seen. Is religion rubbish or not? Does it matter? There are those who wish to argue about religion that is up to them, but I am not interested. The question of the validity of religion adds nothing to our understanding of God. From the position of neutrality we have choices. We can choose if we wish to accept the position of God in our lives or not. If we accept that there is a God then we can decide our relationship with God based on what we feel comfortable with rather than what a particular religion tells us what our relationship should be. My first question when I meet people who call themselves atheist is are you anti-religion or anti-God? Mostly I find that the atheist position come from inability to separate religion from God. 
but being religious or anti-religious is no basis for deciding for ourselves as we wish to accept the concept of God. It is for each of us to accept or reject. And if we decide to accept then the form of that acceptance is also a personal choice. We do not have to choose a religion to accept God. Josef Albrecht has a variety of life experiences. He was born in London, England and migrated to Australia in his early twenties. David has had a various career paths, starting as a builder's laborer through draftsperson, flying instructor, architect and writer, with considerable overlap. Other books by Josef Albrecht David's alternative series of books examine society's belief system to see if there are alternative interpretations or aspect to the many beliefs we take to be true without thinking. Many things are not as they seem to be. The alternative series of books include, Alternative Jesus, Alternative Genesis, Alternative Relativity. More titles to follow.